And we're back. For those of you who tried to join us earlier today, um, I am privileged to be joined today in my studio at The Reason We Learn by Dr. Stephen Hicks. He is a professor of philosophy at Rockford University in Illinois. Yes, round two. Executive director of the Center for Ethics and Entrepreneurship and senior scholar at the Atlas Society. And he's written six books. Amongst those, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism, and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, Nietzsche and the Nazis, The Art of Reasoning, Entrepreneurial Living, Liberalism, Pro and Con, and he has a book coming up, which I hope we'll get him to tell us a little bit about, this year, Eight Philosophies of Education, co-authored with Andrew Colgan. So um, this conversation is probably going to be a little different than you might be used to seeing if you follow Dr. Hicks. He is an expert, obviously, in philosophy and postmodernism, so a lot of people pick his brain about that specific subject. Being that this is a channel focused on education specifically, I'm going to be talking to him about education, his expertise in that area, the philosophy of education, and how the current crisis we're facing with CRT, most people see CRT and they think that is the, you know, that's the beginning, middle and end of it, or that's the biggest piece of the crisis we're facing now. And I'm hoping to um, pick his brain about whether that is true, whether there's more to it than that, how concerned he is about this crisis, and then what we might be able to do about it. So without further ado, let me welcome Dr. Stephen Hicks. Hello. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for this invitation. You're so welcome. Thank you for, for joining us. So um, I wonder if you would indulge me briefly and go on a little trip in the Wayback Machine mm. with me to something you wrote in 1991. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. It's in the way back. <laughs> it is it is in the way back, but I think it's relevant because mm. one of the things I've been trying to share with my audience aside from the fact that this is not really new this crisis, it's just very visible now, is that they their children are being asked to do too much mm. with their little minds. So let, let's let me see what this says. It's a truism that you can't teach calculus before arithmetic. In trying to convey their sense of urgency about the world's problems, many teachers are committing an analogous error. Children are not able to deal with problems of international garbage disposal when they're still grappling with issues of personal hygiene. They're not able to put in context issues of international race relations when they're struggling with how to deal with schoolyard bullies and being talked about behind their backs. When students are overloaded, they become frustrated and frightened. When they think the problems they are being asked to consider are too much to absorb, they give up trying to understand. If the teacher persists, the student simply mouths the appropriate words to appease him or her. This does not mean educators and parents should pretend that problems do not exist. But many of these issues by definition are complex, global issues, issues that many adults have difficulty dealing with intellectually and emotionally. We need to take extra pains to teach our children about the principles involved on a scale they can grasp. And finally, frightened or apathetic children are not going to grow into the adults who will be able to solve the world's problems. Problem solving requires confidence that solutions can be discovered and a healthy self-esteem about one's ability to find them. These attitudes require nurturing over a long period of time on countless small day-to-day -to -day issues. Too much, too fast can only destroy them. Mm. Do you remember writing that? Well, yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Wall Street Journal, yes, 1991, and I can't believe it's been 30 years. Uh, right. But yes, uh, everything changes, but everything stays the same. Right. Yeah, that, that's uh, you know, partly it's an important point about uh, developmentalism. We're all familiar with uh, raising children and we, we scale things down physically to, uh, to a level that their bodies can can handle and we want to, to push it. And the exact same thing holds on the psychological side. There's only so much a young mind can and, uh, understand, process, uh, not only intellectually, but also uh, e emotionally. So one of the problems we do have is the overloading problem. And that's what that quotation is about. Now, I, I do think some of it is, uh, you know, in, in the case of parents and teachers, they uh, overlook the developmentalism issue. They, they're aware of it abstractly, of course, uh, but they get worked up about something or they're worried about something. And uh, that just leads them to say, 
this huge problem, my kid needs to know about this and my kid needs to know what the, the right answer is. Or, or, or if I'm a teacher, uh, my kids right, need, need to know this. And it doesn't matter if it's an environmental issue or an issue about sexism or now or issues about racism, the adult is worked up about it and then just lays a huge amount of stuff on, on the kid. Now, that's to some extent, I think, excusable if you're a, a parent, but I think we do need to hold teachers to a higher standard. They are supposed to be professionals. And uh, I think the bigger problem that we now have and have had for, for a few decades now is teachers who are actually less interested in education and more interested in indoctrination. Uh, if you are uh, attentive to education, you will pay attention to all of the developmental issues and you'll be very sensitive to the cues that you're receiving in response from, from the children. But if you are an indoctrinator, then uh, you're, not, you're not at all interested in that. You have your agenda, whether it's an environmentalist agenda or some sort of political agenda or about race or about sex or whatever it is. And uh, you don't mind overloading children because you know if you get in early when their minds are still unformed, you will uh, you know, kind of capture a certain amount of that psychological real estate and, uh, and hopefully that will be yours for, for the rest of that kid's life. So, so am I correct in hearing you say there's an intentionality to it? There's there that people who are doing this are more aware than not that they I are think, doing it. Uh, yeah, no, I think there are two groups, and we would need to do some demographic surveys. But I talk, you know, I've taught philosophy of education for now decades, uh, and I do you know, know that in, in my my classrooms, I, I regularly have. Uh, three groups, right? Those who are genuinely interested in education, uh, those who are confused, they're sort of interested in education, but they get enthusiastic about whatever the issue is, and they uh, are then much more range of the moment. And there are those who are strategic. You know, they, they realize uh, uh, very clearly that uh, they have an agenda, whatever the agenda is, political, religious, social, or whatever, and uh, they're not at all interested in debate, discussion. Uh, they do want to, uh, to form young minds. And they do see those minds as kind of plasticine to be formed by them, the authority figure. So right. it is explicitly uh, um, intentional. But looking at education in America in general right now, would you say that the, the crisis we're in is one it is a philosophical crisis. Would you describe mm. it that way? And if so, or if not, you know, why or why not? Oh, certainly. Yeah, uh, it, it is a crisis, uh, but it's in, in a way it's nothing new about education because education is always philosophical, right? If we think about ourselves as parents, you know, we have, we have a, a baby is born to us and it's our, it's our kid and it's now the most precious thing in the universe to us. But we get very philosophical because we think, you know, this kid has his or her whole life ahead of, of him or her. And then we start to think about uh, all of our hopes and all of our dreams for their kid, what kind of life we want them to have when they're a fully formed adult. And we understand this awesome responsibility to help bring along this, this young human being so that he or she can lead that kind of life. Right. That's to put it abstractly. What kind of life are we talking about? And there you're doing philosophy. You know, right. What are the important goals? Uh, what really is going to make a life meaningful, significant, happy, fulfilled? And so we, we plunge deeply into moral theory and ethical principles and issues of character. And we start to think about you know, uh, careers and uh, all of the skills and capacities that need to be developed. So we are, uh, we, we are philosophers uh, uh, as, as parents. So what uh, some parents, of course, do is you know, they go out and they buy an armful of books or they start binging on, on, on how to be a good parent uh, stuff on, online. Mm -hmm. And then what we do hope, though, of course, is that the educators, people who are spoken to be professional teachers, and administrators of schools, that they are very strategic, and that is to say very philosophical about, about the issues. Now, what makes it a crisis, uh, uh, in a way, a, a permanent crisis, and it, and it might be overstating it to say that we're always in crisis mode, though, is obviously that's a very complicated project. You know, what is it to be a human being? What are the important values in life? 
-hmm. What are the core capacities and skills uh, that we need to develop in human beings? How do we develop good character in people? And we know that people are all over the map on, on, on right. all of those issues. So we always have these big philosophical debates. But then what happens, of course, is uh, one set of philosophical uh, positions will come more or less to be in the lead. There will be a lot of new schools that are started based on that model or some reforms that are introduced on that model. But the battle is never decisively won because right. then in the next generation, other perspectives come along and they chip away or they start brand new schools or sometimes it captures a political administration and you'll get some very heavy duty top down uh, reforms that go on. So we're always in in the midst of that. So right. it's just uh, right now, as important as our battles over critical race theory are, they really are a, a skirmish in a larger uh, conflict of, of visions, conflict of ideologies, and even more broadly speaking, conflicts of uh, philosophies. Can you expand on that a little bit more when you say a, a conflict of visions? I know that Thomas Sowell, I believe, has a book by that title or something along yeah, those lines. Yeah, that's right. So I might have unconsciously channeled Thomas Sowell. Yes, <laughs> right? he's great on this issue, yes. Right. But um, <clears throat> it's something I've tried to explore on my channel with my viewers that I call it a project, right? That that they may be working on a different project for their child or think they want to be than the schools and the education establishment is. How would you characterize the project American education is currently working on if you had to kind of sum it up? Yeah, I, well, I don't think th there is a project. I think right now, one of the frustrating things about American education is that it's a, it's a mixture of contradictory projects. I see. So, okay. So, uh, and this is part of the reason for uh, the book I'm coming out with with, uh, with Dr. Colgan right now on eight philosophies of education. So if you just say, look at you know, American education or Canadian education right now, uh, there is no one systematic mission statement or mission plan that goes on there. Instead, at almost any school you look at, you can find elements of, uh, of behaviorism, elements of uh, neo-Marxism, elements of existentialism, uh, things that have been uh, from, from, from Montessori, mainstreamed, uh, things from uh, John Dewey and various forms of pragmatism and progressivism and so on. Now that's to use some, some high flowered language and, and sure. some big name theorists. But what has happened over the course of the last century has been there was a you know a given model that was in place and it was an early combination of kind of religious idealism that had been somewhat secularized but then a big push to be more naturalistic and more scientific and then that ideal of liberal arts education of training young minds to think for themselves and then a certain measure of authoritarianism still the teacher is this paternal or maternal figure and you do what you're told so already you know from the beginning there was a mixture of different uh, philosophical right. elements. But then, right. then along comes, you know, John Dewey in the, the teens, the 20s and the 1930s, extraordinarily influential. And yeah. they capture a certain amount of the curriculum, not only the curriculum, but also so methodology. You can even see it in many cases in, uh, in architecture. How do you design a school to instantiate your, your philosophical approach yeah. and so forth? Yeah, it's, it's everywhere. What counts as proper assessment? What kind of teachers are we planning to to hire, you know, are we are we interested in someone who's just got a whole bunch of book learning? Are we interested in uh, you know, in someone who's got some working experience and some lived experience, right, or not? Are we interested in you know someone who maybe dropped out of high school and then this is going to be a little bit later when existentialism comes along? Because after World War II and in the 1960s, that was very sexy and that was it was, a lot of that was incorporated into the schools. You know, mm -hmm. so we want teachers you know maybe dropped out of high school. And you know, hitchhiked across the country and started a rock and roll band, and then you know, made a pilgrimage to uh, the Himalayas and so on, and mm -hmm. comes back and you know, isn't just a book learning, you know, to teach to the test smart kind of person. Uh, th and then, of course, uh, various sorts of neo Marxism and now postmodernism are all part of the mix. So, I'm sorry I can't answer your question and say, uh, you know, well, what it is. Instead, what we have is a, a smorgasbord or a toss salad of, of different philosophies right now. I think I was. Um, I think what I was trying to understand is whether, at the somewhere down the line, after they got done trying their smorgasbord, okay, 
they were aiming for sort of the, the, the core values had changed. So in other words, I think when my dad went to school, now he went to Quaker school, so it's a little different, but um, mm. he was born in, in the mid thirties, you know, very different. But the things he told me, the things my grandfather told me was that they were getting an education to be able to preserve liberty, to be, you know, to understand, you know, how to think and, you know, think critically and so forth. Yes. And so when mm -hmm. I went to school, I was told as a child, I went to Montessori school actually until I was about nine years old. Mm. And then I was put into a regular public school and it was horrific. <laughs> I mean, the transition was really jarring. Um, but I'm so grateful I had that brief amount of time in Montessori because I think it was more influential than I will ever fully understand mm. in terms of my thinking and my confidence and my own ability to learn and all kinds of things. But I think my, certainly in my family, we thought an education is about learning how to live life on earth. I think that's why I gravitated towards objectivism. It just made so much sense to me. Mm, you know, mm. Okay, an instruction manual for how to live life on earth. I need to think and it's not going to always be pleasant, but this is what you do as a human being. Yeah. It seemed automatic. Sure. And I feel like as a, as a teacher myself and as a mother, what I'm looking at are people increasingly who are mm, not really interested in that. That's That's not really what they're focusing on yeah, absolutely seems like, right yeah so and then i was kind of wondering how you would describe it, it if we look at one side of sort of the american creed or the american ideal the enlightenment ideals of you know what a good person a decent person should be engaged in that the individual matters those type, types of things and then today like how might they be different well, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be completely different. Just the, the the important concepts in your 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 heartfelt summarization uh, summarization right now. Uh, you know, does the individual matter? Are we interested in uh, preparing students for to live freely, right, in a society that is genuinely uh, encouraging of liberties and tolerance for different uh, their lifestyles in the pursuit of happiness? And already, all of those four things that we just mentioned right now are you know, not only questioned, but radically rejected by most uh, mainstream intellectuals who now are in positions of prominence at schools of education. And then behind them, philosophers uh, of two generations ago now who also rejected all of them. So it's going to be that your education system is fundamentally different depending on if you think you are dealing with individuals mm -hmm. who have their own minds and that you need to develop in them confidence and self-esteem and the ability to weigh complicated issues and trust their own judgment in the final analysis, or if you don't really look out and see individuals, what you see are children born into different groups, right? right. First you see this is a, a girl with a certain skin color, and I know she comes from a certain religious and or ethnic background. Mm -hmm. And so she really is just a, you know, an avatar for those different collective identities. Right. Uh, now, if that's the way you look at your students, that's going to be very different. And then if you say, well, I do have that little girl right, uh, with a certain skin color and a certain ethnic background, but I've also got these little boys who have different skin colors and different ethnic backgrounds. And if I see them merely as vehicles through which there are different group identities coming along, then my education project as a teacher is quite different. Right. And there's going to be you know, different, different strategies, but already you're not interested in cultivating the individual's self-development. You are seeing them as a, 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 a vehicle through which various collective or group forces are going to be operationalized. Right. Now, I might then say, well, you know, I can't have one curriculum for everybody because, you know, that little girl with her constellation of identities is very different and she's on a different life path from that little boy who's got a different constellation of identities and he's on a different life path. So maybe I need to have two different curricula right, at the beginning. And then, of course, we can see, you know, then I'm going to need four or eight or 32, right, or whatever. And what do I do if I say, well, here I have girls from, you know, one racial group and ethnic group and boys from a different racial group and ethnic group. Maybe they shouldn't even be in the same class anymore, right? Because right. after all those groups, and then here we have a different thing. You mentioned the Enlightenment. Do we right. think there are universal rights that all human beings 
have and that we should respect? Or do we stop believing in universalism and, and, and rights as very broad principles that ultimately, you know, we have these conflicts, but we should be able to work out these conflicts uh, and, and, and reach peaceful, uh, negotiated, sometimes compromises or just changing our minds and, and, and so forth? Or do we say, no, 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 these groups, they have their different agendas and they're just in conflict with each other and ultimately they hate each other and there is no way to have peaceful conflict, in which case you're going to be pushing in the direction of saying, I'm a, a, a manager of conflict <laughs> as a right. teacher. And maybe the best way to manage these conflict is just to put these people in different groups and give them entirely different educations. And so rather than to, to use more recent American language integration and universal ideals as the goal, I'm back to some form of segregation. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're just the expectation of managed conflict as my as my process. So it becomes very that's, philosophical very quickly. Do you think that we could end up in that place? I mean, looking at for just critical race theory on its own, we've also got culturally responsive education, social emotional learning, anti racism, you know, gender queer theory. All of these things coming at these kids, most of yes. them when they're pre literate, <laughs> never mind pre, you know, mm. uh, rational and I don't know how you're not going to end up, as you described, with frightened and apathetic children who haven't even had the space and time to deal with all of this. This is heavy, complex yeah. stuff. No, absolutely right. And so uh, in the first place, parents have to wrap their minds around it. And then the professional educators uh, have an even greater responsibility to wrap their, their minds around it. And I do think a lot of it is, uh, you know, a certain amount of it is professional irresponsibility. You always have a certain number of mid-level managers who are just, you know, they've got a job, they just want to preserve their job. And so they just go with the flow, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So our attention really needs to be focused on the deciders. And that's going to be the, the education strategists, the people who are forming and making decisions about curricula and parents, because parents... Uh, are, the, are the ones who ultimately the, the responsibility for their chair will devolve to. There's, there's no shortcut. We, we have to be educated about, uh, about all of these issues. Mm -hmm. Now, then, uh, then you're coming back to uh, you know, our first point. If you just dump all of these issues on children, then, of course, you are going to, to overload them. So how, how you do that, that's, that's the hard project. Now, already as parents, we, we, we know about this. You know, we know that the world out there is wonderful and it's full of opportunities, but also there's a lot of dangers out there. So typically we are very sensitive when we're raising our children. You know, we, we, we have the, you know, these very insulated environments for, for the infants. And then we give the, the kids the, the run of the yard and maybe they can go over to the neighbor's house and, right, and, and go to the park you know, with some semi-distant adult supervision. Then they can start riding their bikes around the neighborhood and, and going off on errands and so on and so forth. But we are staging it out just with respect to that one, one issue of, of right. safety. But what we're not doing is you know, telling four-year-old girls that there are lots of uh, rapists and there are lots of you know guys out there who kidnap little girls and dismember them and do this. You, know, you don't do that with a four-year-old girl. She can't handle that amount of information yet. Well, we're also telling four-year-old girls now they might be boys. Mm. So, I mean, one yeah. other thing I wanted to get your your insight on is the the shift towards unreality. So, in other words, you know, there's the the enlightenment project of education if I may generalize, and then you have one that might be a little more social justice focused if you want to get real political about it, but it's gone past that it feels. It got it's gone towards a kind of alternate reality, pseudo reality, I'm not really sure what you want to call it, where reality is questionable. And if you try to assert that something is a fact, scientific fact, look, I can observe that this is true, that makes you actually a bad person. It's not just yeah. you have a different viewpoint, that you assess reality differently, there's virtue attached to seeing things not as they are. Yes. or questioning everything that this is, and saying to a four-year-old, or in this case, let's say a kindergartner, a six or seven-year-old, well, this is your gender assigned at birth mm -hmm. by your parents. I mean, these kinds of messages, I think, hit a small child pretty hard. They're very concrete thinkers, and that's I just don't see how we don't end up with kids who have some challenges with mental illness, literally. But I don't sure. know. What do you think about that? 
Well, yes, I, mean, I do want to bracket a little bit the discussion of uh, transgender right, types of issues. You know, the, the science, I think, is very complicated there. That was just one and, example. No, I, mean, I understand, yes. Could be race, sure. could be anything. Just yeah, something exactly, where question exactly. everything that is. is very, that's right. So, yeah. so then the question is going to be just as, uh, you know, issues of the history of race relations or gender right. relations or international politics. And what do you think about uh, China and North Korea and Iran and so forth? Uh, yeah, issues of uh, your uh, your sexuality and your your entire approach to your 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 love life and your romantic life and so on. Again, it's going to be the same principle. We have to <laughs> scale that up and make sure that if we're talking to four year olds, eight year olds, eleven year olds, we're talking at a level that we know they can understand. And then hopefully, it's not just you know, the average eight-year-old, but uh, we get to know our children as individuals and, and we understand their particular context, right, and so on. So again, what we do have is uh, the people who have a certain kind of agenda. It might be a sexuality agenda. It might be a race agenda. It might be an environmental agenda, and they are willing to overload uh, students. Uh, but also, you know, part of it is is not just that traditional ideological overloading, you're emphasizing in your question, this issue of a willful suspension of reality. Right. And uh, you know, what typically would happen a generation or two ago or three is people who went too far down that road, they would just be laughed out of court. Right. So however much we disagreed about you know, race relations or gender relations or, or how to deal with, uh, with the, the uh, you know, totalitarian dictators in, in, in other countries and so forth, there was a, still a shared commitment to some sort of reality is reality, facts are facts, and we need to be rational and give arguments and so on. So why there has been a, an intellectual and now increasingly cultural shift where we don't have to do that. And so some of the crazier people in each of these movements have a larger microphone, to use that uh, outdated metaphor now, uh, precisely is because of my profession, philosophy, uh, and this is what we you know, abstractly call postmodernism, but it's been extraordinarily influential, and it's been a movement that says, as a matter of you know, reality, we have no idea what reality is. You know, as a matter of logic, there is no logical way to get to these things that are called facts, and they really have uh, bought into the idea that what we call reality just is a subjective construction, or in many cases, a subjective projection that we then will ourselves into believing, and that everybody does this, including scientists and so on. So uh, if that's the way it is, why bother learning logic? Why bother learning scientific method? Uh, and we're not even going to insist that there are any such things as facts. Instead, they're going to see it as a kind of, uh, kind of metaphysical liberation, if I can use that that big mm -hmm. phrase. I'm, I'm free from reality to create my own identity, to create my own uh, uh, reality, and that I then as a teacher am going to encourage young people to do the same thing. Then how, how does someone with that mindset explain Richard Branson going into space the other day. I mean, how do, how do we explain the vaccine we got in in a year? How do how do we explain things that are that weren't, let's say, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, whatever. How how do people like that explain these things that were developed out of science and progress? I mean, one of my concerns as a parent is that what teachers are doing is painting a picture of the world that does not comport with reality. It's very negative. It's very dark. And yeah. they don't have any other information coming in. And you're going to have expectations about your life, plans for your life. They're going to vary dramatically. If you see the outside world as this dismal, terrible, burned out husk of a place that you have to be liberated from, then if you think it's full of opportunity and wonders of modern science mm -hmm. and so forth. So, I mean, what do they think? How do they explain these things? Or do yes. They? Well, uh, th that's where very quickly it will become conspiracy theory. So, you know, just as you know, did we really land on the moon? Wow. Uh, you can, oh, no, th that's true. And that's, but that's going to be one strategy. But the more common strategy among the intellectuals who see themselves as anti-science anti-enlightenment will be a diversion 
strategy. So instead of talking about Richard Branson went into space, what they will do is they will say, how did Richard Branson make his money? And then it becomes an ad hominem thing where you will you know, dig into his biography, hopefully find something unsavory. And then on the basis of that, that undercuts any sort of, uh, any sort of achievement. So rather than celebrating an achievement, you don't want to do that. You are looking for the clay feet and you try to drag as many people's eyes over to the clay feet thing as well. Now that'll be a very particularized thing about say Richard Branson in person or in particular. Right. And then you'll just do the same strategy scaling up the abstraction until you're saying really the, you know, the, the scientific project uh, is just European white males for the most part who have their own set of neuroses and they're just projecting cause and effect order onto the world. And then people's attention is diverted to that understanding of it. And so they're less likely to, to be uh, excited and fundamentally uh, attracted to a scientific project. Now, the same thing is, is uh, to come back to an earlier example you were mentioning. You know, if we are teaching American history or we are doing civics education, that's an extraordinarily value laden part of the curriculum. Very true. And right at the very beginning, you'll, you'll make a decision. Do I think that basically the United States is a good country? Yes, it's got some problems, but the basic thing is we're teaching a good news story while, of course, acknowledging the facts of, uh, of, of, of negativity to are there. Or are you fundamentally committed to I dislike the United States, or in some cases, I hate the United States, in which case your whole approach to American history and civics education will be fundamentally different. Right. And so to, to parents who might be watching this, thinking about what they thought or hoped their, their child's education would be and what it's sounding like it is or more like, regardless of why, whether it was intentional or bureaucratic, you know, mm. going with the flow. Um, what can you tell them about what, it, let's say they would like to preserve the American creed and they want their kids to have a more enlightenment based education. Yes. What should they be thinking about looking for in terms of the I mean, without giving necessarily specifics, although you probably could, um, I mean, how should they be thinking about this? Because I, as I said, I see people going into school board meetings and, and sort of nipping at their heels about this specific lesson plan or curriculum when, in fact, the whole, um, the whole message of the school seems to be, no matter what lesson I'm using, it's coming down to your child as one piece in a group pie. Mm -hmm. Right. And that it's a fixed pie. And so for, it's power struggles and these kinds of things. That's why I say, you know, I'm up here with it. What should parents be looking for and doing as far as education for their children? If they want their children yeah. to be more like the old kind of American enlightenment value person in the end. Yeah. I, I don't think there are any shortcuts here. You know, we already know the cliches. Parenting is a huge all in project. And so uh, you know, dealing with formal education, uh, if you have chosen to send your, your, your kids to school, you do need to be all in on that. And uh, uh, you know, just as uh, parents of newborns will typically uh, self-educate intensively, uh, the same thing has to happen when you send your kids to a school and you, you've got to stay in the game. Uh, for as long as your kids are are in school. So I would say, yes, self-educate, read, right? think about it, listen to a uh, podcast by, uh, by reasonable people. Uh, and then uh, parents who are taking the next step, the activist step, which I think is great, you know, going to the school board, maybe don't speak the first couple of times, listen, uh, get, get educated. But then yeah, ask questions, connect with other parents. There's always a uh, strength in numbers uh, and, and, and become aware. To the extent that you uh, have something decent to say, a question to ask, ask those ask those questions. Mm -hmm. uh, another cliche that's absolutely true is the sunlight is the the best disinfectant. So in many cases, uh, uh, pathological and dysfunctional and destructive movements they they make progress to the extent that they are operating in a vacuum or in the dark, and people are just not not paying attention to it. So. Put them on notice that you're you are paying paying attention. If you are yourself a, a decent 
well-meaning, uh, educated person. And nobody expects anybody to be, you know, a, a, you know multiple PhDs and so forth. Uh, uh, then that will come across, and they will they will take you take you seriously. Um, so uh, I would say also consider seriously all of the other alternatives that are out there. You know, uh, formal institutional public schooling is just one model. It's relatively a, a new kid on the block in, in, in historical time. It's, uh, uh, I think, hugely dysfunctional in many, many ways. But we are an entrepreneurial culture, and we are an educated culture, and we are a rich culture. So we, we have the resources to start doing other kinds of experiments. And uh, there are lots of experiments going on there, Brad. And again, figure out what they are. And you'll find out that by talking to other parents and, and getting a little educated uh, and so on. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, to the extent also that you have some, some interest, start your own blog, start your own podcast, uh, you know, do your things on social media and so on. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's, uh, that's how it happens. So right. it has nope. to be grassroots. Now, we, we titled this CRT and the education mm. crisis, so I don't want to go all the way through without touching on it because it is such a, a, a hot yes. button topic. Um, what what can you share with the audience about it that you think they should know or should be thinking about when they hear CRT, critical race theory, or yes. even just how they might fight it more effectively? It's it, I see it as one piece of the puzzle, but what what do you yeah. think? Well, I think the, the same issues that come up in uh, critical race theory are going to come up in kind of critical feminist theory. And there are environmentalist versions of it. And there are uh, you know, ethnic and religious versions of it as well. So you're right, it's one piece of a puzzle. But once you spot the pattern, then you see it's the exact same thing that's, that's going on over on, in the other uh, domains of argumentation. So in the case of uh, you know, racism, all of the issues about uh, what is a race? Uh, what is racism? Uh, how do we combat racism and so on? Again, we're going to have very different philosophical approaches to that. Now, my view is that in the United States, you know, we're an extraordinarily progressive culture with respect to uh, race and racism issues. Vast majority of Americans are, are uh, uh, kind of universalist. The important thing is you're a human being, you have your own mind, you have your own values. We all should have the same rights, life, liberty, pursuit of uh, happiness. We should all be entrepreneurial and self-responsible in our lives. That part of the American ethos is very strong, and that's the vast majority of, uh, of Americans. Even recent immigrants, who in many cases bring with them uh, kind of old-fashioned uh, values, they very quickly assimilate on, on those values. So we do have a problem of racism, traditional racism, but it's a, it's a small percentage of uh, of, of, of Americans. I think the bigger problem we have is what I think of as the race hustle industry, where there's a number of intellectuals and activists who want racism to be a bigger problem than it is, uh, in part because that's what they get their sense of identity from, and in some cases that's what they get their, get their living from. But uh, on CRT in particular, uh, the important thing is that on every standard anti-racist thing, they don't agree with that. They have a completely different understanding of what racism is, how serious it is, who is a racist and who is not a racist, and how to combat it. So in one case, uh, people who are traditional anti-racists, you know, think Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, and so on, they will say every person is an individual. Right. And as an individual, you have certain uh, uh, moral dignity and moral rights that should adhere to you as an individual. Right. The CRT people do not believe in individuals. For them, first and foremost, we are fundamentally members of racial groups. And that's a, that's a deep. Are you first and foremost an individual who happens to be of a certain race? And that might be interesting and it might be important in a few contexts, but it's definitely secondary. Or is your racial identity separate? Do we think that people have agency, uh, control over their characters, control over their minds? Traditional anti-racism says, yeah, absolutely. Right? What we need to do is educate and empower every single individual so they can be self-responsible and they can do that. And then they can live a free life and go off. Whereas the critical race theorists do not believe in agency. 
They see people as, uh, and this is all of the victimology language, right? Because you're in a member of a certain group, right? You are just kind of constructed by your group membership. And uh, if you happen to be in a smaller group, then you are disempowered by members of the dominant group. So they don't believe in agency. They believe that uh, people are pushed around and so on. So do you believe people have power as individuals or do you see them as, as a, right? So do you think that when we talk about uh, the rights to liberty and uh, judging people by their character and having equal rights for everyone, do we really believe in those ideals or do we have a cynical interpretation of that? And this is the critical race theory. No, 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 people don't really believe in that. That's just a good news cover story that we're uh, using to whitewash uh, bad parts of history or to, to try to get uh, the minority racial groups to believe in so that they won't fight so hard for, for their rights. So are you an idealist about our prospects for racial harmony or are you deeply cynical and so on? Now that's just three issues, but when you lay them all out, it is a fundamental opposition all the way down. So. Being an anti-racist, what that means for most people, the opposite of that is what critical race theory is advocating. So as I was listening to you speak, it occurs to me that the questions you were asking would make excellent questions for school board members. So yeah. in other words, rather than saying, are you doing critical race theory or are you doing this, to mm -hmm. ask them where they stand. What do you believe, as you put it, you know, do you believe that individuals are, you know, and so forth. And I think those would be good if parents are watching, you might want to go back through that. I might make a clip of just that part because mm -hmm. um, I think those are some great questions to jot down because the answers will be very telling. Yeah. They are open-ended enough that you're going to get a window into how these people really think and they can't just answer them yes or no really mm -hmm. easily. Um, they should, ideally they would say yes, unequivocally yes to some of them, but they probably won't because there's so much politics involved. So I think it would, those would make a great list of questions to get some sunlight onto yeah. the philosophy, at least of that particular school district. Yes, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, part of it uh, is, is very contemporary. Part of it would be about history. So you would have to choose your, your target carefully. So one question would be, do you believe that most people are decent and trying to be anti-racist? Or do you believe that people are in fact racist and they are lying about it, uh, their racism, because they aren't allowed to, to, to be racist? And Find out what the answer to that question is. Right. Uh, if you're talking about history curricula and civics education, uh, you know we're talking about 1619 project and and how history is going to be going to be taught. Uh, to ask the, the question, when we teach history, should we say if we go back to the 1600s? Well, basically everybody in the world was racist. Everybody in the world was practicing slavery. Nobody right. had a problem with slavery uh, uh, and so forth. And the important thing about American history and actually more broadly European history is that for the first time in history, you start having some early Englishmen and early uh, Americans saying, hey, there's something uh -huh. wrong with racism. There's something wrong with slavery. And then they build movements and you know, uh, gradually eliminate racism. Is that the st historical story? Or do you believe that uh, uh, the, 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 the original sin, and this is the language that the critical racists will use, they do. Uh, is exclusive to Europeans and to Americans, and that what they've been doing is pretending to be progressive on those issues, but underlying, we still have an idea that we want to have second-class citizens for racial minorities and so on. So push them exactly on that historical divide. Right. And I, I, I noticed there are a lot of people in the sort of 30s, so looking at 1991s now, who appear to not know. I mean, to literally not know the history. They were not taught. So yeah. it's not that they have decided to reject it. It's that they were not taught it. So of course, to their ears, it sounds like a lie. It sounds like a conspiracy theory or something you sure. made up to cover as a cover story yeah. because they weren't taught. Um, even I, who graduated high school in 83, still had to learn most of the history I know after 
high school graduation, college, and even later. And yeah. a lot of it surprised me. I thought there were black people who owned slaves. Mm. There were the black Africans actually sold black Africans. Like this was news to me. Yes. So for sure, people in their 30s were not taught this information. No, right. They weren't no, we taught about the uh, second generation on this. Yeah, yeah. the politicization of, uh, of American history education was largely accomplished in the 80s and the, the 90s. So we now have a generation of teachers who are you know, perpetuating that, that one-sided historical lesson and actually right. a wrong historical lesson. Right. Now, somebody asked in the chat earlier, and I wanted to ask you, what do you think about our culture's apparent fetishization of teachers, where we say teachers are heroes. Just the title teacher makes someone a hero. Um, I personally, as a parent, ha have a problem with it because I think it puts parents in the position of believing they're experts, like doctors, you know, mm. that, that they know more, that I couldn't possibly educate my own or do the homework you're talking about, like educate yourself. Yeah. You couldn't know because you don't have an education degree. Um, do you think? that parents should <clears throat> question that push back on that premise more that you're automatically a hero because you teach yeah well now as a as a matter of uh, demographics i i think you're right right if, if you just go and look at the average teacher right now then hero worship is not going to be the right kind of response right to that and i do think that's uh, largely a, a debasement for all of the professionalization and certifications and so on uh, it has been largely a dumbed down profession. And sorry for the blunt language, but that's no, that's exactly please. <laughs> it's true. The, the way it is. Yeah. Uh, I, I know for many years, I, I've mentioned I've taught a philosophy of education and some absolutely brilliant, motivated, wonderful human beings have, have, have been my students and gone on to become teachers, but they are in the minority. Uh, most people, I kind of like kids, you know, I don't want to work a desk job. I like summers off. I know it's a pretty good living despite all the complaints about teacher pay and so forth. So it's pretty low grade motivation for many, many students. And then of course, uh, what happens is uh, with our heavily unionized system and politicized system, uh, what we have is uh, teachers get tenure and it becomes very hard for them to, uh, to be fired. Uh, and, and, and performance reports are, are largely meaningless. And so what happens then is uh, you, uh, <laughs> you have a lot of uh, students who may have had youthful idealism become fairly quickly demoralized. And the ones who hang around are the ones who don't mind being demoralized for the rest of their lives. And they pass that on onto their students. Gone in two years. That was me. Gone in two years. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's that's the healthy response, right? So you go off and you start your own school, or you you find a, a healthy institution uh, with it within within which to work. Right. But I do think uh, the proper response should be uh, to have teachers on the same professional status as doctors and lawyers, and for the same reason. Yeah, we do know enough about human biology and human psychology uh, that it should be standard part of teacher training to be masters of, all, of both of those fields. Uh, it, it should be. Now, now in fact, I, I don't believe there should be such a thing as an education major. What I think is that there should be, you, know, you get a college degree in biology or in history or in physical education or whatever you are passionate about, but you become a real expert in that field. Then maybe you take a couple of months certificate program about how to make a syllabus, right? And how to hold teachers meetings, right? And, 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 and how to uh, do assessment and so forth. Uh, but that's, that's, a, that's a minor capstone thing that goes on. Then you go and you become a teacher. Now, in some sense, uh, then you've got the expertise uh, and that's the most important thing. And if you want to become a teacher, then hopefully you are passionate about kids and you're passionate about your discipline, all of the other stuff, you will pick it up uh, uh, along the way. So I think largely the education major is a, is a waste of time. And unfortunately, again, speaking from personal experience, I know a lot of students who end up as education majors, they start off as biology majors or, or whatever, and uh, they realize, Wow, that's actually difficult stuff. And then they they uh, they switch their major to to education. 
I don't want to get too anecdotally, but we do have, uh, you know, at my university, a, a standards committee that's got faculty members on it. And uh, I don't know how many times I've uh, read uh, letters from students who got put on probation or kicked out for a while. And they will literally say, yeah, I started off as a, as a, as a, as a chemistry major, but then I realized that uh, chemistry was, you know, kind of, kind of too difficult. So now I'm going to become a, an education major and hopefully teach high school chemistry. And then you just change, change the discipline. Wow. And yes, so that that it, explains it, the appeal of things like equity, math, and culturally responsive STEM. <laughs> no, well, that's right. And then, yeah, it just, once the standards get debased, then they get uh, you're on a downward downward slide, and then it's institutionalized and politicized, and then you have a very big problem. So I think all of that is a scandal. I think it's profoundly irresponsible that uh, universities, uh, including my own university, and certification boards and schools of education allow that to. Uh, allow that to go on. Uh, if you think about children, you know, they are, uh, when we are parents, our most important asset. So we are sending our kids into the care of other human beings for a dozen years. We should be holding them to the highest professional standards. And just as we are hiring a lawyer to defend our kids, if there's a legal matter or sending our kids to a doctor, we do our homework, we monitor, we are there. Uh, no slack should be cut, and not to mention, uh, you know, the the two hundred or two hundred fifty thousand dollars of our money we give to the politicians uh, to educate uh, each of our children. It's, the stakes are very high. Exactly. So I know we're we're c coming into the the end of our talk, and I just wanted to get your sense of you know how concerned are you overall? It, so it sounded earlier like you were fairly optimistic in the sense that you know Americans are still a very independent bunch, very individualistic bunch um, culturally, yeah. but I I wish I shared your optimism. So can, <laughs> you, can, can you tell me like, I mean, how concerned should we be, yeah. let's say as parents <laughs> about our children um, yes. with this education crisis being what it is with things like CRT now being embraced by the teachers unions that first they denied it. And then they said, you don't understand it. Now they say it's fantastic, and if you oppose it, you're a terrible person, and they want it yes. in every school district. Right. So one reason to be optimistic is that obviously those arguments that you just threw out, they're not very good arguments, and they can be defeated. So, and uh, the other encouraging thing is that uh, suddenly in the last few years, we do have large numbers of parents who are paying attention and who are pushing back. And these are smart people. Uh, they might not be professionals in education and so on, but they have a brain, they know how to use it, they are savvy, they can, excuse my language, they can smell bullshit when they, when they smell it. And then CRT fundamentally is in the, in the BS category. And they're doing something about it. So I think all of that is very healthy, very good. And uh, you know, I do think when the argument is challenged, the people who have the better arguments and who are better informed and who are genuinely more committed to the education of children, they will prevail. That's not to say that it won't be ugly, and it will be ugly for the next few the next few years. What I am uh, more worried about is uh, my own profession, because all of the arguments that are used by CRT people and all of the other pathological intellectual movements out there that are uh, infecting education right now, uh, and that are very current in the schools of education, they were developed by philosophers. And then they, uh, you know, so the philosophers are kind of the, the laboratory scientists in this respect. So they develop these arguments. They get picked up by the history professors and, and, and the literature professors. And then they get repackaged in the education schools. And then they go retail in the, uh, in the public schools. So uh, while it is in part a political battle at the local level, state level, and federal level, it is a cultural battle as well. There will be battles in the education schools, but I think, uh, you know, not to pat or to elevate philosophers too highly, but uh, education is a philosophical enterprise. Uh, and so it's going to be those who have the best philosophical uh, arguments that will prevail. So I hope so. I certainly, I certainly hope so. Now, the, and, other, the other part of the optimism, though, let me just say, I do think is, is technological. So, you know, I am... You know, very encouraged you know that we are we are rich so we've got a huge amount of money floating around for experiments in education we can build all sorts of 
alternative programs and and, and see which ones work right and and, and don't uh, but then also the students themselves you know they uh, they might be getting garbage education six or seven hours a day in the formal schools but <clears throat> music lessons outside of school, martial arts lessons, sports lessons, and all of those things are great, uh, uh, you know, teachers, right? And then what goes on inside the home and what uh, programs the students watch and what they explore on the internet. Uh, and, and, and really, you know, education fundamentally, when you get right down to it, is self-education. And so the students themselves, you know, they're young, they've got all that energy, they do have curiosity if they have a, a, you know, a functional uh, home environment to come. Uh, we can help them. Uh, it's not the case that only what happens in the schools uh, is as important. So we can fight the school battles, but also we've got a great culture otherwise in which uh, students can be opportunistic. Right. Now, what are your, in, in closing, can you tell me what are your favorite books other than the ones you've written um, about <laughs> <laughs> about education? Like if I, if, what would you recommend that I or any of the people watching should go read to just yeah. better inform themselves, even if it's not specifically about education, it could be about something else that might help parents just feel more solid in their own philosophy of education or why do we need this? What is the point? Yeah. Well, uh, we mentioned Montessori earlier mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I, I would say I'm kind of 95% on board with traditional Montessori. Okay. Uh, I would say uh, get, read Dr. Montessori's own handbook. It's a, it's a very nice, short introduction to uh, Montessori education. And she's just a wonderful human being. Uh, and that comes through. And even if you don't agree with her, her prose is so clear and her our, our ability to say, this is what education is about. And to put it right there, that will make you think about all of the right issues. And I think you probably will end up agreeing with, with substantial amounts of Montessori. Now, education is an ongoing scientific experimental project. So we'll be updating Montessori with new information as it goes, uh, as it goes along. So that's the first name that comes to mind. Okay. And then on the basis of that, since she is a, an educational practitioner who actually built schools, but she's also very philosophical and scientific, uh, uh, from her times, she will help elevate all of us to the right way to think about the science and the philosophy as it bears on education. Well, I know that I get questions all the time from parents who have to use the formal schools, the public schools, and they say, they're teaching my children what to think, not how to think. What recommendations can you make that, to help them possibly at home learn those missing critical thinking skills, active thinking skills they're not necessarily getting? I know you you have some information about Socratic method, for example. Yeah. But what, could, what could a parent do? Is there something they could read or encourage their child to read or... Yeah, well, I think uh, yeah, dinner time conversations are are great about this, uh, particularly if uh, there are siblings, because as we know, sibling rivalry is a is a is a phenomenon, and uh, um, it, it, in some ways that can be dysfunctional, but can also be you know fun. All of the teasing, and someone says this, but then someone contradicts them and says, "What about that?" So I think a huge amount of uh, learning how to defend yourself from criticism and defend a, your position better. Uh, comes around the family dinner table, and then parents, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, managing and having a benevolent context, and then filling in larger context and so on. So, eating meals with your family on a regular basis, I think, yeah. is a wonderful educational thing. There's actually uh, statistics to back that up. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was just armchair philosophizing on. on yeah. That. Yeah. I'd also say uh, uh, watch television with your kids. Watch their program. Watch all of the kid shows. You know, it might not be your thing, but uh, we learn a huge amount from movies and TV programs, and a lot of them are are, are moralistic, you know, good versus bad, and the ridiculous and the silly and the, the heroic and how problems get solved. And it's all of the situations of uh, of, of kids' lives and, and, and middle schoolers' lives and teenage years and, and so on. It's all there. Right. So sit with your kids. And you know, laugh at the funny parts and cry at the at the sad parts. But kids are going to have a hundred questions through all right. of these shows, and you're the parent. You talk about that stuff, and that's right. just a couple of informal things. 
And, but those are great ideas because as you were speaking, I was thinking of my own life and I grew up with a father who was a litigator, but oh my. <laughs> okay. So you're sitting at the dinner table and you're a teenager and you make some statement about something in the world. And where did you get that information? Why do you think that? Exactly. Well, in comparison to what, you know, and all these kinds of things that how and do you know? A beautiful, that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it, really, it really, it really is. Yeah. yeah, it it really is because I certainly wasn't getting that much in school. So I think that's where I got about 90% of it. And I would recommend that to anyone watching. It does work. I mean, you, you probably don't want to do it every single day because the no. kid eventually rolls their eyes and says, no. oh, I'm not talking anymore. No, yeah, no, let it flow. And, and yeah. again, this is a developmental issue when things get a little sure. heated. Yeah, that's where you cut it off and you divert the attention to, uh, so what do we have for d dessert or whatever? Right. I was cut off. I used to watch Nightline and I was told I was not permitted anymore. <laughs> <because> <laughs> it was too much, too fast. I had just too many opinions. But uh, I, right. I cannot thank you enough for sharing your thoughts with us today and spending this time. I'm so appreciative. I think it was a real pleasure for me too. Thanks. You, you've given us some fantastic ideas as well as some insight into what's going on. And actually a very optimistic message. I feel a lot better after this conversation than I did before the conversation. So great, that's, great. that's always good because it's been, it's been yeah. tough lately. So well, thank reality you. is on our side. Reasoning and the evidence is on our side. You know, we, we can win this debate. All right. Well, on that note, I will thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great afternoon. Okay. Thanks. Bye.